Good afternoon. We will start a most exciting session. This morning, the word leadership has been pronounced so many times. So we want to devote this session to the notion of leadership. And what better panel could you imagine in order to discuss this so important question here in Africa? I'm very pleased on behalf of you to welcome the panelists, Prime Minister Meles from Ethiopia, President Goodluck Jonathan from Nigeria, Prime Minister Naha Sangula from Namibia, and President Bongo from Gabon. We will run this session in a very interactive way, so I ask the panelists to be short in their answers, and I would like to integrate you, the audience, later into the discussion. Now, my first question to each of you, your excellencies, is what type and what kind of leadership does Africa need, let's say in the next 10 years, to shape the agenda of its transformation process? And maybe I start with you, Prime Minister Mellis. Thank you. <clears throat> I think uh, Africa needs uh, uh, a leadership that has very clear plans and strategies to um, overcome the structural problems of the continent focused primarily on inclusive economic growth. So the vision, the strategy is critical. Secondly, uh, I think Africa needs a leadership which has the perseverance uh, to continue on the chosen path when the going gets rough. Uh, because it's going, if there's going to be transformation, sooner or later the going is going to get rough. So there has to be the stamina uh, to persevere when the going gets rough. And the third point uh, is it must be a leadership that is able and prepared to say no. When that leadership is required to act in a manner that is not consistent with the long-term interests of each country and the continent as a whole. We cannot please everyone. Thank you. Thank you, um, Prime Minister. President, good luck, Jonathan. Uh, thank you. Uh, We'll also almost say the same thing, maybe using different words to re-emphasize. Uh, if you look at the African countries, historically from where we are coming from till today, we have been having very, uh, we have been having states that are quite temporary in terms of the leadership because of the military interventions. Of course, we now have most of African states that are, have democratically elected presidents. But the basic thing I have noticed, I wish I believe should be one of the key things for the official leaders of Africa, is for the leaders not to see themselves as above the states, and for them not to see their individual interests above the interests of the state, the sub-regions, and the continent. I say so because most of the conflicts we're having in Africa that is creating a lot of challenges for us is because those of us who are leaders sometimes see ourselves above the state and our interests above the interests of the state. And that is why sometimes we will even want to manipulate our constitutions to stay longer than necessary. <laughs> so if we have leaders that see the states as the ultimate, then that is key. Second, it's a leader. He may not be the best brain. I, I don't think that he doesn't have to be the best brain. 
to be the president of any country or the prime minister of any country. You don't have, be, have to be the strongest person physically or the bravest person to be the president or the prime minister. But you must have the capacity to look at your citizens and identify the competent people and use them properly. Yeah. So if you do that, you will tap the intellects and the energies of your citizens from within the country and in the diaspora. And they will come and work with you for you to transform your own country. I believe these, are, these two are key. The other issues raised by my colleague, the Prime Minister of Ethiopia, are quite, quite fundamental. It should not be a leader that will begin to change based on lethal, primordial things. If you are convinced that certain things are right, you must keep to it. You may have pressure from left or right based on the interests of individuals or other nations. But as long as you are convinced, and of course you alone cannot decide that, you must have a team of competent hands from your state that will work with you. And if you are convinced that that is the right way to go, you must have the, uh, you must have <coughs> the competence and you must be brave enough and bold enough to keep to that for the interests of your own country. I thank you. Thank you. <laughs> President Pongo. I would first say that I fully agree with the, what has been said. What, what is also important for us as leaders is to start first by focusing on our own countries in building strong institutions that would help us develop strong economies. It's important for us as a nation to be strong. It's important for us to work together with others, but to first in our own country develop this, develop this notion of a nation. In many of our countries, we have peoples where we are divided. It's important to have one nation with common gold. And uh, then after that, we work with others as African, united. But it's not, not be a, a, a united, uh, weak states of Africa. It not be united, strong states of Africa. So as I said earlier on another panel, it starts first by house cleaning. By house cleaning, what can we do? And as others have said, we don't put ourselves above the law, but we make sure that we are under the rule of law. And then most, and last and most important, put the aspiration of our people in the core of what we want to do. Attend the aspirations of the people. Make sure. As something strange, it's like a, you always hear that Africa is rich. And everybody wants a part of it. But Africans are poor. So we want to be in a situation where Africa will still be rich, but Africans also will be rich. And we have to work all together towards that goal. Thank you. Thank you, President. Prime Minister Angola. Thank you, Professor Schwab. My leaders have spoken. Whatever I'm going to say is a footnote. <laughs> and I would like, I'd like to, start by, to start by saying that uh, the current and the future African leadership has to define itself from the experience of the last 50 years of African independence. That experience to me is very crucial. Despite many setbacks, in my view, African leaders since independence have attempted to define their vision and their missions. Within the context of Africa and also globally. Within the context of Africa, they have tried to meet the needs of their own people under very difficult circumstances. We particularly give 
thanks to them, pay our gratitude to them for founding the Organization of African Unity, which has been a platform where the African leaders have been able to coordinate their policies. Now, where the challenges are actually in most of our countries are domestic challenges. The management of our diversity as populations, the meeting of the social needs of our people, and of course, the issues of governance, democracy, and accountability. Those have been very daunting issues as far as African leadership in our own countries are concerned. However, one of the problems which, are, which is facing African leadership, and I think it will continue to face African leadership, is the fact that uh, there are external forces which at every turn try to undermine African leadership. We are here talking about economic development, economic transformation, trade, investment, and all this. These are good notions. But we know that uh, globally we are still struggling with basic issues. The issues of fair trade, for example, is a critical issue. Our colleagues, whatever we say in other parts of the world, I think we'd like to see Africa to continue to be the producer of raw materials and the importer of finished goods. I mean the experience of the negotiations with uh, the economic partnerships with the European Union are very instructive in this regard. What Africa demands is actually to be treated fair, fair trade and to be allowed and to be allowed to define its future i think the future of africa now is that africa must transform itself especially the economy by transformation i'm not meaning diversification i mean to start to add value to our raw materials so that we are not to continue to be the exporter of raw materials, as it is. Right now, Honorable Brown was saying that the contribution of Africa to world trade is something like 12 percent. And I'm asking myself, with all the volumes of things we export, that's all what we are able to, to contribute. And I suspect that you are being shortchanged really, through all sorts of uh, mechanisms, transfer, you know, pricing, what not, what not. And uh, I think we are not being treated fair. So if African leadership is given a chance, it will emerge. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Prime Minister. What I would like to do now is to ask specific categories of participants to make comments or to react um, and then I will ask the President and Prime Minister to react again, so we have a true dialogue. And we have here uh, in the audience uh, young global, young African leaders. Uh, we have the global shapers, and I wonder whether one of the, or two or three of the global shapers would make just a short comment on what they expect from African leadership over the next ten years. Anybody who has the courage? <laughs> yeah? All right. Just first come, first serve. And please don't forget to give your name and the country you are coming from. Good day. Hello. Good day, everyone. Your Excellencies, you're welcome. I'm Ebuka Obiuchendu from the Lagos Hub in Nigeria. Thank you. <laughs> Um, we hear a lot of rhetoric about how the youth 
constitute a large demographic of um, the population in Africa. We hear 60% under 30 years old. But there doesn't seem to be some, anything to back up the talk about the youth being encouraged to take over government whenever the tomorrow that we always hear about comes. How and how, what are you doing to really engage the young people in your countries, so to speak? Thank you. Thank you. I, I take two, one or two other comments from the young people. Good day. My name is Kopano Matlamavaso. I'm from the Johannesburg Hub in South Africa. Um, thank you for this opportunity. Um, when, when our leaders are young, most of our African leaders, they are visionaries, they have wonderful visions for our continent, they are admirable, they, they speak good, they do good. And we, we are young people who want to speak and do good for our continents. But something happens to them once they are seated in those chairs of power. And no, my question is... My question is, we, we want to see our continent change, but we're afraid of this power that corrupts even some of the best, most admirable leaders on our continent. And what is this poison that happens in these chairs of power? And how can we prevent it? Thank you. One more. One more. Hello. Hello, I am Jihada Bunafisa from the Khartoum Hub in Sudan. And uh, my question is regarding women's rights. I mean, uh, it's quite wonderful to see all of you gentlemen up there. But uh, <laughs> uh, my question is, how do you envision the role of African women in shaping the future? And uh, is there any way that you are trying very hard to maybe get the African women to where they belong right up there? Your, your Excellencies, I, I think we have enough stuff to discuss. <laughs> so, uh, who would like to start to react? Okay. <laughs> yeah. uh, 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 I'll start because I want to pick the easiest one. <laughs> um, I'll uh, try and address uh, the question posed by the young lady from South Africa. Uh, what is it that, uh, what is the poison that uh, you, the leaders, face when you go to your national palaces uh, and uh, transforms people with vision uh, sometimes into ordinary thieves? Uh, let's start with the total amount of loot in Africa and what our role as leaders in that loot is. The vast majority of the loot is done by properly organized companies through all sorts of accounting gimmicks. And our role there is to be uh, paid or unpaid facilitators. Uh, that is a very difficult thing to manage. It's a very difficult thing to manage because our bargaining cards are very limited. We need these companies to create jobs in order for them to come to Africa. The image is very negative, so the risk is artificially uh, spiked. If the risk is artificially spiked, the return has to be commensurate with the risk. And so, in order for them to have extraordinary returns, we can't, it's difficult to attract them without extraordinary returns. Uh, and so, sometimes, uh, we facilitate without being paid. 
At other times, we say, okay, if, if, your, if your family's uh, farm is being looted, why not join in? Uh, I think that is the most insidious form of corruption because it affects those, it affects everybody, including those whose hands are not on the tills. The other form of corruption is, is the local uh, type of corruption. Uh, when, if you go to the National Palace in uh, Shwane, you will recognize that the South African state commands enormous resources. And uh, everybody wants to access that by fair or unfair means. And you happen to be the arbiter. Uh, over time, you start making small compromises. And, and once you are compromised, then it is a slippery slope. Uh, but these are fluffy psychological things that I'm talking about. What is the substantive political thing that creates such an environment? The one that creates such an environment is an engaged, engaged citizenry that is able to create an environment where corruption and loot cannot happen at the lower level, at the middle level, at the higher level. And that goes beyond elections once every four or five years. Thank you, Prime Minister, for such a honest, straightforward answer. Um, President, good luck, um, Jonathan. Uh, thank you. Maybe let me start with the young man from my country. Uh, it talks about uh, what we have for the young people and how do we prepare the young people for leadership. Because the very first question talks about uh, the leadership in the context of being the top level of being a prime minister of a country or president. And that's why our responses, our responses were in that direction. But leadership is everywhere. Even at the family level, at the primary school level, we have senior boys, class monitors, and so on. So as a nation, probably at this level, maybe you may use your own nation as a specific example. So if you look at Nigeria, if you look at the political environment, more than 60% of the politicians who are holding either elective or appoint, appointed offices from the states to the federal are very young people. That most of them could be classified as youth. So you really see that as a state, if you take Nigeria as an example, we have been encouraging the young people to grow. And of course, for you to also uh, be in position to contest election, you must be fairly empowered financially, economically. And of course, that is also the reason why, if you look at this government, it's just under one year. But we've come up with some robust arrangements. If you look at the, the you win program, youth empowerment program, why we believe that young people should not just be encouraged to look for paid jobs, that they have limited income, but we should create entrepreneurs from among the young people. And young people don't have the collateral to assess loans from banks. And government feel that the only thing we can do is to create an environment where young people that are very creative should come up with their feasibility studies and we get an international group that is not biased politically or religious or otherwise to assess. And those who we see their proposal worthy based on their need, government gives. I think we are starting with 1,000 something. In Gozi, it's here, maybe so. We are starting with over 1,000 for the first phase. I think 1,600 or 1,300 or so for the first phase. The idea is that each of these will be an entrepreneur and in turn will employ from 5 to 30 to 50 people. The people I gave certificates that day, some of them were already employing up to 30 people to make sure that the young people are coming are not just, yes, we are creating jobs for people, but that is paid job, there's a limit, except you will become a corrupt person to think about stealing. But if you are not corrupt and you keep to your salary, there's a limit you can 
safe for politics. So you must create young people that must enter into the business world where the money is. We are doing that. That is to help and make sure that young people contest any level of election, young people are prepared for leadership. And of course, in terms of appointment, in terms of election, if you go to the state houses for assembly, more than 80% are very young people. If you go to the local government, the councillors, almost 100% are very young people and the chairman of council. It's only at the federal level where I see uh, people a little more older. But even then, if you go to the House of Rep, almost 30 to 40% are very young people. This is to deliberately encourage them to come up. Then the young lady from South Africa, I didn't hear you very well. I was even asking my colleague, but I think the question you asked has to do with maybe our leaders, especially when they want to get into offices, make beautiful statements, campaign, and by the time they got there, you see something different, especially issues of corruption. Am I right? Did you talk about corruption? Okay, so I didn't... Huh? But I think the Prime Minister of Ethiopia answered that. But so maybe the... I will uh, uh, maybe discuss the issue raised by the young lady there. It talks about the role of women. And of course, if you talk about women, then uh, in terms of Nigeria, we are doing our best. At the end of our elections, you have a president, of course, have to be me, who is a man. We have a vice, <laughs> <laughs> we have a vice president, also a man, because of the circumstances of the political environment. But before even we finish with the election, as an individual, and that's what you must also know, the presidents and the prime ministers themselves have limits. I know as a person, the pressure I put on my party and the followers and members of my party to make sure that we bring more women into elective offices, I couldn't get it. I was frustrated. I don't need to come and um, lament here. But I said, well, if I cannot get them through elective offices, because if people have to vote, I cannot compel the electorate to vote uh, whoever. So I said, probably the women have not been empowered enough, have not been sufficiently exposed. So what I can do is the appointed officers that I have control, I will bring the women uh, on board. And now of my ministers, in, we have the, well, no, based on our law, the attorney general, that is the man in charge of law, is number, mainly based on the constitution, is the number one minister. But after the attorney general, the next the person we call the coordinating minister of the economy and minister of finance is a woman. She's here. <laughs> and for the first time in the history of Nigeria, appointed a woman as the minister of petroleum resources. And she's the first woman to lead a delegation to OPEC. That means that the whole of OPEC countries, no country has even appointed a female minister. And if you look at my cabinet, we have ministers holding very, very sensitive offices, education, uh, communication, technology, and uh, aviation. And all. We have about 11 women in the cabinet. And <laughs> Excellent. Water resources, environment, housing, and urban yeah. development, all are held by women. The idea is to give them privileges so that on their own, they will encourage other women to come up. So I believe that this number of women who are brought on board on their own, if they can create one or two other women along the line, then of course, the women coming up uh, uh, will be uh, 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 something that we we'll, uh, look up to. But I always, if I have source opportunity where we are asked about the role of women, I always tell our women that, look, the way I look at Nigeria, for example, in the, it may not take us more up to 15, 20 years. The women will take over almost all the positions. Well, I say so because I'm looking at my own uh, personal experience. Throughout my primary school, I had only one female teacher that taught me, that was even a staff of the, primary, the three primary schools I attended. When I entered the secondary school or post-primary school, also one female teacher that was a staff. She did not even stay up to the end. But now, if you go to our primary schools, our secondary schools, our universities, Almost 50% of the teachers, lecturers, and so on are women. Even in the civil service at the beginning, when I started my career, very few women were holding top positions. But now even the level of permanent secretaries, they're almost getting 50-50, or even more. So I think that had to do with the African uh, history. At the beginning, when Africans started embracing Western education, the, the drive to send women to school was not there. 
They prefer sending the boys to school. Yeah. So for our age and above, you don't have this caliber of women. But people from 45 down, in most countries, you have women that are well-educated, very, very sophisticated. So they must definitely occupy the rightful <coughs> positions in societies. So you so should... Says, <coughs> so it's great hope. <laughs> so uh, if I use Nigeria as an example, I can say that yeah. uh, the continent of Africa, we are encouraging <coughs> women. If you go to countries like uh, Rwanda, for example, I think even ministers and palm sex, about 60% of them are women. Pres so I think we are not doing badly in that respect. Thank you. Thank you, President. President Pongo, would you, would you like to add? Well, I would also like my colleagues make, you know, a few remarks. And I would say that uh, women are most certainly Africa's chance for success for tomorrow. Because as the going say goes, you know, as the saying goes, you know, you educate a woman, you would educate a nation. And uh, in the case of Gabor, the role of women have been very important in a critical phase of our recent history. When my predecessor died, the country for four months was run by two ladies. The president of the Senate, who became the acting president, and the president of the Constitutional Court. Two ladies, two extraordinary ladies. <laughs> and we went through that process without any problem. And uh, this was a great you know, example for people in my country as to what, what women can do in a, in a difficult situation. So, it's also important that uh, we focus on education for youth. And uh, we have found that in Gabon, we're now investing more on education. But we're also saying to leaders, first, do not fear the youth. Because in many cases, sometimes we fear you know, our youth. And it's important to invest, to acknowledge their importance, to make the youth participate, you know, in every level of you know, society, and, uh, and to engage a dialogue. You will, will learn more. And you find that uh, not, you know, though there, we all have been young and we know what it is, and a certain age, mm -hmm. we're not saying that we all wanted, you know, to be like, you know, in a revolution, but we want to make things, you know, the youth want to make things move. And uh, where we are now sitting, say, well, I didn't think it was that way when I was young. And then we are able to speak, you know, and interact, and then get ideas from them, and they push us, you know, to be more, to be bold in our policies. But you also find that, uh, as I said, to empower women is very important because you also find that uh, lead, you know, to uh, connected with the corruption that the least corrupted, you know, are the women. Much more honest than men. And then they are an example for us. And we also have to make sure that we are able not to fear, not to see women as a competition, yeah. but as an asset. You know, something that can someone that can add and help us. And uh, we could not just encourage, you know, uh, women also to particip participate more, to run for elected offices, and uh, also to participate and also be active business, you know, uh, leaders. If we are able to do, so, do that, you know, there will be in a, in a, in a, a better and brighter future for us. Before, thank you, President. Uh, before um, Prime Minister Angula uh, takes the floor, let me just test something. I think for the young people it's um, essential, of course, to provide um, jobs and uh, to provide an optimal education. But you used the word empowerment, uh, engagement. 
Now, today, um, many leaders use uh, social communities to engage the young people. Twitter, Facebook, and so on. I just would like to make a test here. I'm, I'm not asking the presidents. Uh, I'm asking everybody. Who is using, and I ask particularly the politicians, who is using the new um, technological opportunities to engage <coughs> the young people? Please raise your hand. <coughs> very interesting. Very interesting. Prime Minister Angula. Yes. My footnote this time will be very short. <laughs> you don't have to be afraid of me as a prime minister. I start with a fellow youth. <laughs> youth is a spirit, it's not a bald head. <laughs> My fellow youth, I want to start by paraphrasing Franz Fanon, whom we have well studied. Somewhere he wrote that uh, Every generation defines its mission either to fulfill it, either to fulfill it, or to betray it. That is your starting point. You must define your mission. Once you define your mission, you know where you are going. What you have to do is just to mobilize. Mobilize yourself and create a voice. I'm quite sure my senior leaders here will listen when you, you start to speak. Because you have a voice. Use your voice. Now, to my colleagues, gender, uh, I tend to share their concern. This gender equality, I don't think that it will be, a, be achieved through ballot box. It will take a long time. Somehow we have to create some democratic legal structures to make sure that we get there. And I want to, to give you an example of Namibia. At the local authority level, we put in place a law that the leadership at the local authority level must be 50-50. So when parties are selecting their candidates, they have to keep that in mind. Because we realize that through ballot box, we are not getting anywhere. So somehow we have to create structures and uh, legal procedures really to create gender equality if we want to get there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Prime Minister. I would like now to ask uh, two or three um, business leaders to, to um, define leadership, what it needs in terms of leadership to shape the transformation process in, in Africa. And I would like to start with Mr. Dangote. Um, and I'm doing so because I, I, I would like to use this opportunity to thank you also for the great support of uh, the young leaders here and to make sure that the forum can foster uh, African young uh, global leaders in its different activities. Your Excellencies, uh, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I think uh, what we need really going forward in Africa is getting somebody who is very, very fearless, fearless person, somebody who has a vision and mission, and also somebody who is already prepared to take leadership position. And that's why I think it's part of the reason why we supported 35 young global leaders from Africa to join the other parties from, uh, you know, part of the world. And I think going forward in the next decade, we have to have leaders that will run government like a business. Anything that does not make sense shouldn't happen. 
they need to run government like business, but with human face. Meaning that, yes, they will look at what is best for their people, and no matter what, and I believe even the leaders that we have today, they are doing their very best. But you know, it is in, we are in transition. In the sense that, you know, they can pronounce things that they want to do, but remember that they have civil servants which they are actually clogging the wheel. And I think going forward, they need to see how they can dismantle this process and make sure that, yes, they do their work without stopping the water from running. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dangote. Can I ask um, additional business leaders to take the floor? Yes. And don't forget to mention your name and uh, in this case, also your company and where you are coming from. Uh, my name is uh, Gitahi Anderson Young uh, from Kenya. Just a quick comment. Uh, one, one is that uh, I've looked at uh, one of the companies that is represented in this particular forum, one of the multinational companies. I don't want to mention the name. But when I look at the, the net profit of that particular company, and I look at the budget of the Kenya government for last year, and my finance minister is around, you find that the, the, the total budget of Kenya government was a third, a third of the net profit of that particular company. My president is supposed to look at 40 million people, while as this company has 2,400, 2,400 people. So he is looking at 40 million people with a third of the budget of a, of a third of another company here, with 2,040 people. I think sometimes we expect too much from our presidents. I think, I'm not a, a government apologist, but let me say, sometimes we expect too much. We have to put too, not, too much pressure with very limited resources. All that we should ask from them is accountability, and I think they are getting there. The only other thing I want to mention is that uh, sometimes we also put the people in power. It's a forward theory. We put them in power and then start condemning them. But they look exactly like us because we have created them. Thank you. Thank you. Interesting comment. Any other? We should have a third voice. Yeah, please. A woman. Thank you. My name is Rosa Whitaker. And I think that the most important... Could, could you could you give your affiliation and your country? I'm president of the Whitaker Group and former assistant trade representative for Africa in the United States. And the Whitaker Group facilitates investments in Africa. And I think that the most important quality of leadership is first character. Because without character, you really don't have much else. And the second quality is competence. Because Africa's issues are very complex and comprehensive. So I think the issue of competence is very important. And the third is capacity, the ability to bring people along, to inspire people, to have aspirations beyond themselves. Thank you. Thank you. Your Excellencies, who would like to respond? Yeah, yeah please. Uh, I'm not aware of any question. These are comments. Yes, yeah, so, so those are comments. Yeah. Uh, uh, and I, I can't disagree with uh, our sister from the United States. I agree fully. Uh, Dangote's points uh, are also uh, valid. I wouldn't go as far as saying the future of governments in Africa should be uh, to be uh, run like businesses but there are certain business uh, processes uh, that uh, when properly um, adopted to government uh, uh, methods can be helpful. Uh, but, uh, but these are two different species. Business and government are two different species. Even if they look like they are walking on two, fo on two feet, uh, they are different species, so they need to be managed differently. Uh, and with regards to uh, what our Kenyan uh, uh, brother was saying, uh, I think it, 
I was, I didn't put it as bluntly as he did, uh, but uh, I, I uh, implied that um, the government, that the government's take of Africa's GDP, of the official GDP, is very low, and of the total GDP is even lower, and therefore we have to do more with less. Now that does not mean we couldn't do better, because we could do a lot more with a lot less. So that does not absolve our inefficiency, our own corruption and so on, but it's a fact of life. Thank you, Prime Minister. I think this answer is a good reaction to the comments. To, to conclude our discussion, I, I just would like to ask each of um, uh, our panelists to say in, in one sentence what for him personally is the most important dimension of leadership is. For you personally, President Pongo. I think one uh, required quality would have to be honesty. Honesty. Very important to always be able to communicate and say what you are going to do. And do what you are going and do what you are going to what you're saying, and you have to be honest about the challenges about everything that you're doing. And uh, I've noticed that when you would speak speak with people and uh, explain to people the problems, some difficulties that you are going through, people will accept, you know, better someone a leader being honest and saying, "Well, I tried my best to do this. I've not been able to be so successful for such and such reason." You know, it's much better because sometimes we have a tendency because we think that, well, next elections are coming. Uh, I can't say such and such because I don't want to run the risk of being unpopular. A leader should not be afraid to be unpopular, but a leader should always be, you know, afraid not to tell the truth to his people. Yes. President, good luck, Johnson. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> after also, I have to really thank uh, the audience, uh, especially those who had the opportunity to make uh, contributions. And of course, the issue of issue when you talk about leadership, as a person, I always feel that a number of things are very, very theoretical. Uh, you pick the books, even for those of us who are Christians, you have leadership Bible. You have written books, people talk about leadership, a lot of theoretical definition of who a leader is, which to me, all are correct. But one thing probably because of my background, I feel that the key thing is for a leader is like Bongo said, you have to be honest and you must be a person who must know how to solve particular problems. I believe in things very practical, not theoretical. Let me, because I had an uh, experience, I have a good friend when I was a little younger, before I got into politics. That was the time computer just came into Nigeria, and uh, he was working in Lagos, but ran back to Port Harcourt, then my state was not created, and set up a, a word processing uh, a comp, uh, small company that was using computer to do, before people were going to manual typewriter, uh, electric typewriters, and he had a lot of uh, patronage. And, one particular here, he wrote two books, two small books. One of his books is how to manage small businesses. I wrote another book, how to manage a successful marriage. That very year, his wife divorced him, and his, <laughs> and his book, his business collapsed. <laughs> so I, I see most of these things people talk about <laughs> as very, very theoretical. But for a leader, from the little I know, from where I started, maybe as a deputy governor of my state, and I became the governor of my state, I became the vice president of my country, and now the president of my country. Most of the things we read from books and write are good, are correct, but purely theoretical. A leader must find a way to solve a particular problem. And on that, lead, leaders use two different means to solve problems. There's not only one pathway. 
maybe as an uh, ecologist, I used to give an example. I say animals in the wild, feed, many animals feed on other animals. The lion, for example, feed on other animals. But the lion wastes a lot of energy, must be brave, must be courageous, must have the power to run, pursue, and kill, and tear, and eat. The python feeds on other animals, but it does not waste any energy. It just sits somewhere, coil, and set a trap, and still feed. But the most important thing is that both of them feed. So a leader must find a way of solving problems. There's no one pathway of solving problems, but Bongo, you must be honest and be committed to developing your people. And you must see your state superior to yourself. I thank you. Thank you. Prime Minister Angola. Yes. Uh, I'm actually a teacher um, just on uh, sabbatical. <laughs> <laughs> yes, to my understanding, leadership is one and only one thing. Responsibility. Responsibility. And the responsibility. And the way there is responsibility, there is supposed to be accountability. That is what the leadership is all about. If you don't meet your responsibilities, the consequences should be clear. You face the music. Thank you. Thank you, Prime Minister. <laughs> Prime Minister Mellis. I, I, I think I've said my piece. I agree with everything that's been said. <laughs> Thank you. I think we had an extraordinary demonstration of leadership. As a long-time professor for strategy and leadership, let me just add uh, a personal note here. Um, I think I know practically all leaders in the world, and I know all theories about leadership in the world. But at the end, it comes down, in my opinion, to three or four factors. It's brains, soul, heart, and good nerves. Let me explain. As a leader, you have to be a professional. You have to know what you are doing. You have to be engaged in what you are doing. That's the brains. But then you need the soul. The soul gives you the direction. It's a compass. It's the values. It's a vision. I think everybody here in the panel um, put emphasis on the vision. It's a compass. And then you need the heart. Passion and compassion. And I have seen, again, the panelists were all very passionate in what they are doing. And finally, we are living today in a world so much characterized by what I call the four whys, which means velocity, complexity, transparency, and interconnectivity. So to move in such a world, to remain agile, you need, you need good nerves. Now let me thank again the panelists for a wonderful discussion which we had. And we will end this afternoon with a small ceremony which has become a tradition at all of our regional meetings. I mentioned in my introductory remarks yesterday that um, we have here an extraordinary multi-stakeholder community. We have decision makers from politics, business, we have young people, we have academics, but there is one special category which is very close to my heart. It is the, it is the social entrepreneurs, the community of social entrepreneurs. And whenever we do such a meeting, we run a competition to find the very best of social entrepreneurship on the continent, in this case, on the African continent. And this year, in cooperation which we had with Ernst & Young, we had over, seven, over 500 candidates. 
It is a demonstration of the extraordinary engagement which is going on also on the grassroots level. And I think it's most of those social entrepreneurs are young people who want to do something on the grassroots level to bring, to solve issues in a very pragmatic way. Out of those um, 700, but, uh, out of those uh, 500 uh, candidates, uh, 18 are here. And this evening, uh, based on the judgment of a jury, we will just, uh, and it will take five minutes, we will celebrate the five winners, the five social entrepreneurs of 2012 of South Africa. So what we will do is um, I would like to ask the five um, uh, winners to come to the stage and we will present rapidly each of them in one minute to you. At the end, we will give them a nice certificate and have a photo with the presidents. Um, please join me and please applaud the Social Entrepreneurs of the Year 2012. My name is Abigail Noble, and I work with the Schwab Foundation for Social Entrepreneurship, the sister organization of the World Economic Forum. And it is with great pleasure that we present to you the 2012 Social Entrepreneur of the Year Awards for Africa. As Professor Schwab mentioned, these five winners were chosen from over 500 candidates. Their work in a, is an example for governments and corporate partners of how entrepreneurship in the public interest can transform the face of capitalism. I would now like to ask all the awardees to join me on the stage. The first winner I'd like to present to you is a young global leader born and raised here in Ethiopia. Bethlehem Telehun Alemo, Soul Rebels, Ethiopia. Soul Rebels taps into Ethiopia's rich artisan heritage to create durable, stylish, and eco-friendly footwear for international markets. Committed to zero carbon footprint, Soul Rebels offers training and employment to hundreds of underprivileged workers in Ethiopia and is creating a new employment model for local companies. Yulu and Thomas Granier, Association La Vue Nubian, Burkina Faso. More than a decade ago, Sari Yuli, a farmer from Burkina Faso, and Thomas Granier, a French mason, built a Nubian vault home in Burkina Faso. The design of the home is ecologically sustainable and affordable. Association La Vue Nubian trains farmers in the construction of homes, providing a source of income during the off-season. Today, more than 200 masons have built over 1,300 Nubian vault homes in West Africa. <laughs> Samir Haji. New Energy Group, Rwanda. Electricity grids do not reach many homes in sub-Saharan Africa. To combat this challenge, New Energy has developed an LED lantern, which can be recharged using an off-grid, pedal-powered platform. The lantern gives up to 26 hours of light and costs one-sixth the price of kerosene lanterns. New works with 230 village-level entrepreneurs to distribute and recharge these lanterns. It has sold over 20,000 lights. <laughs> Anne
Andrew Muir, Wilderness Foundation, South Africa. Andrew Muir is an environmental activist, conservationist, and community leader. His organization, the Wilderness Foundation, has protected over 200,000 hectares of wilderness and has benefited over 100,000 disadvantaged youth with its, with its educational and job programs. Paul Scott Matthew, North Star Alliance, South Africa. In the 90s, Paul Matthew witnessed the alarming impact of HIV and AIDS on truck drivers and the other members of the mobile community. To address this pressing issue, North Star Alliance provides access to high quality health care and safety services through a network of interlinked clinics known as roadside wellness clinics. Since operating its first clinic in 2005, North Star has grown to 26 clinics across 11 countries. Please join me in congratulating these outstanding individuals and their organizations for the impact and the inspiration they are providing. Congratulations to the winners, but also congratulations to and best wishes to all the social entrepreneurs in Africa. Now to conclude our session, let me thank on behalf of all of you again our panelists for an extraordinary discussion. And I would like to ask the presidents to stay for one moment and we will take a, a good picture with, together with the social entrepreneurs. Prime Minister, we are very much looking forward to a great evening. Thank you again and see you at a, what promises to be a fantastic evening based on your hospitality.